Okay, should we get started? Did we meet our teams on Monday? Got the information all set? Yeah? If you have any more questions about the project stuff, feel free to come to us. So today, we're going to do part two, the sequel of our lecture for Monday. Uh, Monday, we talked about uh, introduction to machine learning, just deep learning in general. And uh, I asked the class on a survey poll of what type of experience knowledge do we have uh, related to AI, machine learning, and so on. So here's the stats distribution for our class. Uh, most of you seem to have at least definitely used AI, right? And some people have some intuition of how it works. So yeah, we're going to bring a little interesting stats. But what I'm more interested in today was I asked, what did we want to, want to learn about? And so I took the sheet and I collated uh, all the stuff that, you know, I condensed it into as many points as I can down here. Um, unfortunately, I can't cover everything because, you know, limited class time and uh, I got to limit it to a space where we can all understand it. So uh, I'm going to try to go through this today and explain as much of this as I can as at a much more understandable piece, uh, probably piece information. So yeah, a little bit of a recap of what we learned on Monday. Uh, we learned that machine learning is concerned uh, specifically with teaching a machine how to do something without giving it uh, code, right? Without giving it specific instructions. And statistical machine learning extracts some pattern from data. So this is something that we came back to a lot. You are pulling some pattern from a set of data in order to learn something about that uh, data set. So DNNs are artificial neural networks. So we emulate how our human brain works using these uh, neural networks in order to be able to achieve this task. So here's an example of a neuron, right? Uh, also sometimes known as a perceptron. It takes in a bunch of numeric inputs. So on the entrance, these are a bunch of numbers, right? You can multiply them by some kind of weight, so some kind of fixed number, and then you add some kind of bias to the end of it. Then this output then gets sent to the next layer, right? The next perceptron, and these are stacked in order to do a machine learning uh, model. So here's an example of what it might look like. And this is where I said I took a picture of a cat, right? And then I feed in each pixel of the cat into an input neuron. And then this value is going to propagate through this um, neural network. And then hopefully at the end, we magically get some kind of prediction output. And here I have some sample uh, what it might look like. So it's 15% of the time, this might be a bird, right? 80% of the time, this might be a cat. Because cat has the highest probability, we're going to say that it's a cat. So here again, we're statistically predicting that it's a cat. Doesn't mean that it's always going to be a cat, but it's very likely that it's going to be a cat. And I used this visualization yesterday, or sorry, on Monday, where if we imagine all the deers are clumped into a group, right? All the cars are clumped into a group somewhere in this space, we can draw some kind of decision boundary in between them such that we can separate these nicely. And I found this really cool visualization tool. Let's see if this is going to work. Okay, zoom, go away. And then we'll do this. Okay, let's see if this is gonna work. I'm gonna do MNIST. So MNIST is a data set, uh, we talked about this on Monday, where uh, it's a bunch of handwritten data sets, right? So these are uh, numbers, one through nine, uh, zero through nine of people writing it. So I'm going to actually choose this. Let's see if this loads correctly. Hopefully it's not going to take forever. Uh oh. Okay. I'm actually going to just try to talk about this as much as I can without that loading. I was running a little bit of trouble into it yesterday, and it wasn't loading either. So that's OK. Let's see, did it load? Let's see if it loaded. Nope. OK, so you can kind of see here that all the ones are kind of clustered in the same group. So the color coding just uh, refers to each label. So all the ones are going to be red, right? But we can kind of see that there are going to be some clustering happening here. So all the sevens kind of belong in this clump. And I'm, as I'm moving the sphere around, all the fours kind of belong in this clump. And the idea here is, at some point, Right, if we look at this space enough, we can kind of draw that black line. Right, If you imagine that black line being projected onto the space, we can kind of do a separation between zeros and the rest of the data sets. Uh, is this ready? Oh, it's ready. Nice. OK, so it's kind of moving. So this is actually doing machine learning in real time. Right, It's sorting the data 
into a specific category. So here is defined to be 10 different categories, and we're clustering similarities between the characters. So you can see now all the colors are kind of clumping into themselves, right? They're, color, they're clumping into their own groups. And if I move this around, hopefully it doesn't break. Now with this um, T, S, N, E, this is a clustering algorithm, right? You can see there's a lot more clear of a distinction in between all the ones, right? All the ones and all the twos are very specifically in their own sphere. So what we're really doing in deep neural network is we're estimating that decision boundary that divides between these data sets. Now, again, it's statistical, so it's not perfectly accurate. And you can see here in this red clump, at the very tip here, you have some of the sevens and the twos kind of mixed into it, right? Because, well, sometimes, you know, when you're writing, it might not be perfect, and it might look like a two. So it's definitely not perfect, but for the most part, we're able to estimate the boundary that gets us to a very accurate prediction of what a character might be. So using a technique like this, we're able to really show and visualize, right, how machine learning can potentially work. So yeah, uh, up next, I want to talk about the different types of neural network, the common ones that we are using right now. Um, so uh, take a little step back real quick. Uh, someone mentioned AGIs and artificial general in, or intelligence. This is not really what we're talking about on Monday, right? So AGIs are really, really abstract theory of being able to mimic human minds from being able to do a number of different tasks, almost as if you know, if you have a kid and you train them to be able to do a bunch of different things, right? So uh, you can think about doing a number of different tasks that can match human capabilities, right? AI from like these movies, from uh, video games like Halo. So Cortana from Halo is kind of almost like a human, right? She thinks she kind of has emotion like a human. So that's kind of what we're talking about as AGI. Um, personally, I think we're actually pretty far away from this. So I know Sam Alton made a blog post about how we're going to get to this and, you know, within 1,000, was it 1,000 days? But, you know, I, I think that it's going to be mimicking humans, but it's not exactly going to be what we imagine as AGIs. So yeah, uh, one step back from AGIs, right? What we have right now instead of the machine learning is we have a single DNN that solves a single problem or task given. So for example, here I'm giving, uh, so you have one model that clearly identifies between cats and dogs, right? And then you might have another model to identify between cat breeds or another model that can do dog breeds. But these are distinct models. They're different models that are intended and designed specifically for the given task that you wanted to do. Unfortunately, we're not to the point yet where uh, you, we can train a model that can do multiple things at the same time, right? So, uh, and then I also got another question about how we might use this, how it would look like as a software developers, right? And right now, the way that we do it, and at least, you know, uh, how standard convention being able to deploy this commercially and just how I do research in general is we, write it into a library. So it's very much like an object by itself, right? And then you'll just feed it some input, whatever input data that you have, images, um, numbers, right? And then it'll give you some results. So that's kind of how we use it right now. Uh, probably how you would use it if you encounter uh, machine learning in your jobs, internships in the future for the moment. So there are uh, a lot of types of neural networks and mostly I wanna cover some of the more uh, more important ones, the ones that are more pivotal to how we use machine learning, and they are feed neural networks, uh, convoluted, convoluted neural networks, CNNs, recurrent neural network, uh, LSTMs. So recurrent neural ne networks are the way that we first did language processing. So NLP, uh, LSTMs are kind of really, really big. Uh, before ChatGPT transformer models got introduced, LSTMs were kind of the forefront of uh, natural language processing. And then we also have autoencoder, gen AI, and so on. So I'll try to cover as much of these as we can today. And the first one is convoluted uh, neural network. So I actually had a, a lot of requests about uh, this one. And we're going to dive a little bit more into details of what we talked about on Monday with the neural networks, because CNNs really are an extension of just our classic neural network. And they're developed and popularized by uh, Lacoon, Dan Lacoon, in the 90s. So does anyone know who Dan Lacoon is? Have you seen his name? It's kind of a Twitter star in our field. All right. Anyone know that he got into a Twitter feud with Elon Musk like half a year ago, right? It's kind of savage. Pretty cool. So yeah, so DNNs that have one or more of these convolution layers are called CNNs, right? And what they really are are characterized by three different layers. There are convolution layers, a pooling layer, and a fully connected layer. And I actually have some pretty cool demonstration of what it might look like. But I guess to give you a little bit of background, um, what it is is we're trying to do uh, an abstraction of our input. So if you imagine if I take a picture of a bike, right? At 
a DNN level, we're really working on each pixels. For each pixels, we're going to try to extract some information and code it in that specific coloring, right? But obviously, an image of a bike, there's a lot more that goes onto it than each pixels, right? There are information that are correlated in between pixels that makes it a bike. So what CNN does is we're trying to, um, I guess, in essence, you're trying to look at it at a more and more abstract, right? Imagine like a bird's eye view. You're looking at it from a higher and higher space, right? How can we try to break apart what makes a bike a bike? And essentially what we're trying to do here, this image is taken from IBM's website, and it's a really cool demonstration of what it really is. So we start off with this full bike of an image, right? And then if we break apart this bike into its specific components, so we, ha we have a frame here, right? Two wheels, the pedal, and then uh, this is the handle, right? And then we, we further break this down, we have like the seat with the frame, right? With the uh, wheels, we've got another frame, we've got handles and so on. So these are what we call features. They're features that belong to the bike, right? They, when we combine all of these together, we get a bike. So CNNs are really what we're trying to do is we're trying to um, map these into a feature map, right? And then we're going to see how many of these belong to that of a bike. And if a lot of them belong to the bike, then it's probably a bike, right? So remember when I uh, showed you the example of the DNN earlier, and I said that it might be 80% a cat, right? Uh, truthfully, it, it's not really a probability that it's 80% of a cat. It's that 80% of the features that we've identified using a CNN belongs to a cat. So it's very likely that it's a cat. Now, our pooling layer essentially just takes the information that we had here and then collates them down into a little bit of a lower dimension. Right. And then finally, we have to fully connect the layer. This is uh, akin to what we've talked about before. It's just uh, neurons connected to each other to be able to pass information. Any questions? I know this is kind of a little bit of a jump from what we've gone, a little bit, quite a bit of an in-depth view. So here I actually have a live demo of how CNN works. And I think this might give you a better intuition of how DNNs work in general. So this application here is trained on the MNIST dataset, which is, again, the Henry dataset. And these are different layers of a neural network. So if you think about our um, the teal neural network that I showed you before, each of these layers are a neuron, right? Uh, there's a lot of neurons in each of these blocks, but th these are the layers of it. And at the very top here, I have 10 labels. So at the very top here, I have 0 through 9, which correlates to the prediction of the model, right? And then at the bottom here, this is my input space. So each pixel that I draw on here, so if I draw the character 2, right, it shows up here. So CNNs, the way that it works is for each of these layers that you see here, can you see my mouse? It's my mouse, right? Yeah. So each of these are a convolution layer, right? So this is this whole layer is a convolution layer, and these are operations. You take um, the input layer, which is a two, and then you abstract some features up on it. And then you figure out which part are you interested in based on what is shown here. So specifically here, if you see all the teal part that's light lit up on the second layer, right? These are the things that the machine learning models are snapping onto. These are the things that it thinks is correlated to what makes a character two, two. Um, does it make sense to us as human? Well, specifically, not a lot of characters have this line at the bottom, right? So this little edge at the bottom, only really twos, maybe ones if you, you know, if you draw up the bottom line, has this feature. So you can see that it kind of lights up across the board with this part, right? This curve at the top, the swan looking thingy, this little curve is also very specific to two. So by using this information, by collating a bunch of these features, it's able to guess, right? So these are the fully connected layer. It's able to propagate this information up our neural network and eventually arrive at the fact that two is the most likely character that I've drawn here. Yeah, pretty cool. Pretty cool, right? So I figured, let's mess with this a little bit, right? What if I'm a very poor handwriting person? So let's see, let's see what happens if I just do this, right? This is a very, very, what is it supposed to be? A one or a seven? Right? I don't really know. It actually, it guessed one. I guess that kind of looks like a one, right? It could be a seven. Second guess is eight. So again, you see here that it snapped onto this line, right? So not a lot of characters have this line that goes down the middle. Sevens do, but maybe the sevens are a little closer to the right side of the character input because, you know, you have the line across and then you go down. So it's snapping onto these specific parts that makes a character a character and then using that information to... Um, decide what character it is. And you can think about this if we use cats, images of cats and dogs, right? It could be features such as like, if you abstract it out, it could be just a ear, right? You, so one of these filters might show um, a specific specific uh, ear, right? A very black, gray, abstract image of an ear from your image, right? Maybe a nose or maybe like the shape of the face because cats have very distinct um, faces, feline faces. Uh, yeah. 
then you can also hide these layers on this website, you know, if you're interested in, uh, yeah. Okay, so there's another uh, resource here. Uh, this one is kind of small, it's really hard for me to show. So I'm just gonna leave it up here. Uh, I will, uh, these slides are gonna be posted later after this. Um, you guys are more than welcome to mess with it if you want to. So that's really how CNN works. And that's, they're really good for image, speech and audio detection uh, because we're able to abstract away feature, what makes an image an image, right? What makes a certain, um, the way that I say a certain word, right? They're very correlated. So. Um, the next one that we want to talk about here are RNNs. RNNs are uh, neural networks that actually feed back to itself. So when we think about language, right, language have context or semantics that are connected to the previous sentence. So if I uh, have a conversation with someone, right, the sentence that I say before and the context of the things that we've discussed matters to what we say in the future. So with what we had so far, uh, I guess, sorry, let me go back real quick. One thing that I forgot to mention here is uh, CNNs are something called a feed-forward network. What that means is when we put our information in, when we put the pixels in, it goes through this neural network and it comes up with an output, right? So this is feed-forward. We don't take that information and we don't go backwards, right? Recurrent networks take that information and we feed it back into our neural network. So at the end of it, we get an output, but also with that output, we're also taking some information from the last layer of our neural network and we're putting it back into our input. That way, when we're talking about you know, when you're using chat, chat isn't on RNNs, right? But if, you, if you're talking about language models, right? When you talk about something to the model, it's able to remember what you said in the previous sentence, right? It's able to have that context that flows through the neural network as we, um, you know, chat with the chat bot. So uh, let's see. Yeah. So this is what an RNN would look like. So this right here is just a, uh, the same neural network that I showed you before. But now we have an output that we loop back into our neural network as we get our next input in. Um, so traditionally, RNNs suffer from this problem called the vanishing gradient problem, which is where when you're training a neural network like this, when you're adjusting the weights with the backpropagation algorithm, the nodes at the very front kind of loses the gradient. So you don't really get a lot of training happening with these neural networks. So LSTM is called a uh, long short-term memory, which is a type of model that aims to address this problem. And this is really, what drove uh, natural language processing for many, many years. And they weren't really having a lot of success with this model. It's good, it's fine, but obviously it's not chat good, right? So um, that was kind of where we were right now. And that, again, uh, the LSTM is able to remember context and that's the important part. And actually we'll come back to this later. I'll show you a pretty interesting application of this, not in language, it's actually pretty cool, right? I think you guys would find that pretty interesting too. Okay, so next type of model. Um, now we're actually, this is, we're moving away from uh, neural networks. Uh, this is requested by some of your peers. So decision trees are actually one of our classic machine learning models. These are relatively simple. They're actually just full charts, right? You take a start point, you take a decision node and you say, does it belong to A, B, or it doesn't have to be binary, right? It could be any number of categories that you choose it into, right? If it belongs to category A, right? If you are satisfied with the salary range, then we check the next uh, criteria, right? Um, is it close at home? Yeah, okay, then we check the next part, right? If it's not, then we reject it. And then if you're able to remote, then you accept the offer, right? So another example that I would give here is like birds, right? If you're trying to identify birds, maybe you can sort your data such that uh, our first thing that we're interested in is the habitat, right? Because that tells us which part of the world the bird might be from. So our first question might be, you know, what kind of habitat does our bird live in? If it lives in Arctic, it might go in one path, right? If it lives in a tropical, like Amazonian, uh, environment, then you might go down another path. So you can keep going down um, with more and more specific um, features of that bird, such as beak length, right, feather color, and so on, until you get to what kind of classification it is. So this really is what a decision tree is. It's very simple, but at the same time, it actually works for a lot of the problems that we have, uh, classification problems. Okay, and then the next one are called support vector machines. So these are a very, very elegant solution to our separation problem. Uh, in last class, we talked about linear separation where we have two classes of data in a space and we want to be able to draw a line that separates them, right? SVMs um, takes that linear regression to the next level, right? This is, we, uh, essentially what we're doing is we're taking two points in a vector, these are called um, support vectors, right? And then we're gonna draw a line in between them such that our line separates these two categories the best. 
And SVMs are really good because they require very little training data, right? Machine learning, um, traditionally in, in what we're doing with neural networks, right? You need many, many data points. You need millions, billions of data points in order to get a really good model, right? But these really don't take that much. Uh, again, depends on how complex you need it to be, right? But if for simple problems, they really take 10 data points kind of stuff, right? And they also can handle nonlinearity, right? When we talked about linear regression, uh, we're explicitly only dealing with data that can be separated nicely by some kind of hyperplane or a line, right? But uh, SVMs can actually deal with nonlinear data by projecting it into a higher dimensional space, drawing a line between them, and then projecting it back down into a normal space. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not very good at explaining SVMs because that idea is actually pretty complex, right? I, when I first took a class on uh, machine learning and I learned about SVMs, I was pretty lost. Uh, a couple years later, I took another class that mentioned it, I was still pretty lost. So I found this visualization online of a video, and I think it does a very good job. So we're going to watch it together in class, and hopefully this will do a very good job of being able to visualize how SVMs really work and how they can separate data. And again, the reason why I want to cover this so much is because F SVMs are really good at what they do. So um, for most problems, you actually probably want to start off with something like this before you try to use neural networks, right? Because if you have a neural network, it's kind of like a hammer. Everything looks like a nail to you, right? But sometimes you don't need that amount of power, right? Neural networks are expensive to train. They're very expensive uh, for in terms of energy, right? Uh, storage, and then also development costs to train. Whereas SVM, you really only, you know, you can just kind of like putting a line. So let's watch it together and see if we can get a visualization of what it looks like. Okay, what do we think? Pretty cool, right? Very elegant four line in Python to be able to start training your own. So yeah, I got a little meme for you, right? This seems a little too easy, isn't it? This is kind of very promising. Seems like it can solve most of our problems. So where's the gotchas? Data bias, right? So some of you have mentioned this in a survey, so at least we have an idea of it. Uh, data bias is where DNNs are going to pick up sensitivities in these um, data points, right? So uh, protected attributes such as gender, race, and so on are going to automatically get abstracted into features for neural networks if you use it as an input space. Uh, an example here is the Compass uh, system, which is 
uh, one that assigns bail, right, to um, potential uh, criminals. And what we found is, well, when you train it on uh, existing data, right, it's biased against minorities, right? It's biased against certain groups of people because, well, historically, our justice system is biased against those groups. So machine learning algorithm will take that and also uh, extract it and unfortunately use it against it, right? So we actually have used this system in Michigan for a while until, you know, we stopped using it. Um, Harvard admission. So uh, I went to this talk by um, uh, Patrick McDaniel is also another really big name in machine learning, right? So he gave this example of Harvard mission where um, out of all the things that gets an applicant accepted from uh, to Harvard, what do you think is the number one thing? Any guess? Yeah. If there are Oh, if, if the parents went to Hogwarts, uh, uh, Hogwarts. if the parents went to uh, Harvard, right? Yeah, good guess. Not it though. Any other guessers? Yeah. Race, no. Uh, so they're smart about this. So they got rid of all the protected attributes, right? So race and gender are not considered. Anyone else? Yeah. Class. Uh, protected also, right? It turns out if you're on the varsity tennis team, that's the thing that determines if you're going to be on, if you're going to get into Harvard or not. Why? What's special about varsity tennis? It's a very random thing, right? It has nothing to do with academia. It has nothing to do with why would that be the choice? Right? Yeah, go for it. <laughs> Correct, right? So varsity tennis is correlated, whether you know we want it to or not, to upper rich white class, right? So machine learning model will actually pick up from stuff like that, right? Even if it's in between two different features, right? Even if it's in between, for example, uh, varsity or the region that you come from, right? It will pick up those sensitivities in that data. So when you're training a machine learning model, it's very important to keep in mind that you should, first of all, never use uh, protected you know, uh, attributes in your model if it determines you know, something about the person, right? And then also that indirect features can actually have this information encoded into them. That way, if you use it, then the model will still pick up the fact that you're using these, well, you're not using it, right? You don't mean to use it, but the model is using it regardless. So yeah, uh, it's talked about protected attributes should not be used in these important decision makings, right? But well, sometimes it's important, right? Age, gender, um, race is actually important in some settings, for example, medical data, right? So heart attacks affects specific group a little bit more. So maybe in those settings, you actually do want to use this, right? So it's very important to think about what applications that you're going to use this in and then think, well, how much data bias is going to happen, right? Do I want this bias? So how do you reduce bias? It's actually pretty hard. It's a very hard problem, right? Uh, for machine learning, this is about the data, right? If you have garbage data, your model is going to be garbage. So it's about how you augment your data, right? How you change your data such that you can reduce this bias. How exactly do you do that? Well, that's kind of still an open challenge, right? Uh, you probably want as much add more data points that re like moves you away from the fact that JV, for example, uh, tennis team is correlated to getting into Harvard, right? So you can add more examples of people who are the same classes, but don't play JV, that also can get into Harvard. Interpretability. This is a really big challenge with neural networks, right? So I talked about before how the way that we implement these is we take it, we give the function an input, it does some computation and it gives us an output, right? So this is a blessing and a curse because blessing-wise, it's very easy for us to use. You feed it some input, you get an output. but at the same time, how do you get there, right? A neural network, essentially, it's just a bunch of numbers stacked together, number, a bunch of linear algebra stacked together, right? So how can I tell when a model says that this is an image of a cat that it actually is making that decision based on the right things? Uh, yeah, pretty hard, right? Actually, not really solvable right now. Uh, there, there are some things such as heat maps which highlights which part of the image that are being used, right? But uh, we can't really get to the point where we can have the neural network consistently explain to us, right, why you made this decision or like how can you correct it, 
that's not something that you can easily do. So here, we're going to visit, visit DNNs, right? We're going to pretend that we're the DNN again. Uh, so we trained ourselves last time, so we're going to do that again, right? So start with a blank state of mind, capital Raza, where we don't know anything, right? And I showed you that these images, right? The top half, I'm going to say, are cats, right? And the bottom half, I'm going to say, are dogs, right? So let's just assume that we're trained based on just these images, right? So I'm going to ask you, what is that? That's a cat. Oh, that's a dog, right? It's a dog. OK, what's that? It's a cat, right? It's just, that's Rex, right? It's a cat. What about that? That's not a cat, though. That's a dog. Whoa. How did that happen? Why would I say that's a dog? Yeah. Oh, all the cat pictures have blank backgrounds. Very good. All right, so I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to take the answer one step further, right? It's actually the other way. All the dog images have grass in it. So because this data that we've trained on only contains dogs with grass in it, the next time that I see grass, I've only seen dogs with grass, right? So it only makes sense for this picture to be a dog. And this is partially the reason why your data is really important, right? If your data is garbage, your output is going to be garbage. So you need to make sure if you're going to train it on images of cats and dogs, right? You need to make sure that your background, right, consists of a variety of them. And mostly, you know, this this is normal, right? If you scrape internet data for cats and dogs, right? Dogs are generally outdoor animals, so there's going to be a lot of pictures of them in grass. But cats are generally indoor animals, right? So you're going to get more pictures of cats indoor. What about this thing? What is that? That's still a cat, right? Oh, sorry, that's a dog, right? That's still a dog, because it's green. This is also another really good example of things that we haven't seen before, right? If you haven't seen something before, the machine learning model is going to classify to the closest thing. It's going to take the features that happens the most and then classify into those into that category. But obviously, you know, if the features are not supposed to be in that category, the machine learning algorithm is not going to know about it. So overfitting. Overfitting describes when our DNN becomes way too good at our training set, but unable to process other data that you expect it to be able to. For example, if I have trained it on 1,000 images of cats, and my model is really, really good at predicting those 1,000 images of cats, right, at 100% accuracy. But if I give you an image of a cat that I ha you haven't seen before, and your system explodes for burned sound, that's not good, right? Then this is something we call uh, generalization, right? It's the ability of a DNN to adapt to newly and previously unseen data, right? Such as the testing set. So again, this is generalization is a very important concept that I kind of want you to walk away with uh, at least knowing what it is, right? It's the ability to be able to use what you've learned and apply to things that you haven't seen before, right? And the things that you haven't seen before should ideally be things that you should know about, right? So again, if I give you an exam, right? And you've learned about the content in the semester all year long, but I change up the numbers, you should still be able to do it, right? It's just the numbers are different. OK, out of distribution data, uh, this is kind of like the cutting board example, right? So if you have never seen something before, how am I supposed to know what it is? So here, um, this is research from uh, one of the previous uh, PhD students that Dr. Chen has. Uh, we have an image that uh, correctly gets classified into a car, an automobile, right? But what happens when I add things that we haven't thought about before? What happens if it rains, right? If there's a raindrop on the camera and it captures it in that picture, how does it affect the prediction of it? So this raindrop can cover, for example, a chunk of the screen, right? This is normal. This could happen, right? But um, we as humans should kind of still be able to tell that it's a car. But the machine learning model now completely fails and thinks it's a cat. So how can we address this, right? Uh, if you have data set, right, trained on specifically NBA players, and you fit me in there, right? It's very odd, right? It's out of, it's out of distribution. It's not going to fit in that model. Your model's not going to know what to do with it, right? The same thing about driving data, right? If you only train it on sunny day, right? Really nice streets, sunny day. What happens when it's nighttime, right? What happens when it starts to rain? What happens if I take my car and I drive on like a snowy mountain, right? How does your car respond to it? So your data is really important to have to capture all the things that your system is expected to be able to perform in. Uh, we call these auto distribution data. And we have some techniques that can kind of detect when it's drifting away from what we expect it to be able to do. 
but uh, obviously it's still a very open resource space that we're working on. Data contamination. Again, garbage in, garbage out, right? You're gonna hear this a lot. So when uh, your quality of the data, right, when it gets contaminated, when you mix it with things that you have seen before, you can't really tell if you're gonna, if you have done a good job training the model anymore. So uh, another example here is if you scrape the internet for data, right, if you just grab a bunch of pictures of cats and dogs from the internet, how do you make sure that these are actually right, right? If you, if you automatically label them, how do you make sure that no one posted a stick figure of a cat that you don't want to learn from, right? How do you make sure that no one are trolling with posting pictures of dogs that just call it a cat, right? So this is a very large challenge. And you, you can see how with ChatGPT, if you just scrape things off the internet, right? You're going to take that information and some of those contaminated data, and it can ruin your model. What about misleading results, right? We talked about how DNNs will always give you an output, right? Even if it doesn't know what it is, even if it hasn't seen it before, right? And um, the DNA might not be correct. And even worse, it could be very confident that it's correct when it's not. So last lecture, I gave you an example of the CrowdStrike incident, right? It was very confident that it's a security breach. But when you asked it, you know, how did you get this information? Then it will, you know, fess up and say, uh, well, you know, I don't know anything about that. I just generated it based on what's very likely to happen. Right. So safety critical system, I think the most important thing is there has to be multiple like things that you're using to make your decision. Right. So for example, in an autonomous car, right, rather than just using your camera to decide everything, you might want to use camera and radar, right? Where if your radar senses an obstacle in front of you, you stop, right? Because there means that there's something in front of you, right? Your camera might not detect that object, but you have radar and lighter that can potentially catch things that your camera module missed. They're also prone to adversarial example, right? So one of my research, we uh, worked on being able to generate these perturbation here. So this, I amplified it by actually quite a bit of a factor to be able to see it on the screen here. But on the left here, our neural network is actually able to predict all the cars in the image, right? This is actually a pretty good job, right? You want to draw bounded boxes around all the cars. But if I add this filter multiplied by, you know, it's a very small perturbation, and I get this image, it's now failing on all the cars, right? So this is an output of the neural network. We're not able to find any cars in this image at all. So these represents very small gaps in the machine learning data where the model is not able to correctly classify because it, the decision boundary, right, is not drawn exactly where you separate the class data. What about dead internet theory? Does anyone know about this? I think you were talking to me at the end of the class about this, right? So this is a theory that, you know, um, the things that are on the internet are kind of, you can't really use it anymore as chat, right? Because, well, chat GPT are being used to write articles, right? It's being used for a lot of things and people post things that chat generated. So when you are training for the future iterations of chat GPT, where we're still, again, you're gonna scrape into the data, we're taking partially what we generated, potentially junk, and using that as training data. So progressively, our future model are going to get worse and worse because it's going to essentially be training on stuff that it itself generated, right? So how do you deal with plagiarism, by the way? Chat just scrapes a lot of stuff from the internet. It just takes all the books, right? And it spits out text and ideas from these offers. But obviously, it doesn't know where, it's not going to cite it, right? It doesn't know where it came from. It's just a bunch of training data to it. So how do we deal with plagiarism, right? How can you make sure that the sources can be trusted? Again, random articles online, how do you make sure that they can be trusted? Microsoft, I think, at some point released an AI, uh, I think on Facebook. And it's, uh, pretty soon it started spewing a lot of anti Semitic, like Nazi stuff, right? And it had to get taken down pretty fast. So, how do you make sure that those kind of data don't get incorporated accidentally into your training set? So, uh, any questions so far about the challenges of AI? Yeah, okay. Where do we use AI? Uh, applications, right? So we've seen it in medical imaging, we've seen it in autonomous driving, um, picture, bugs, identification kind of stuff. Uh, so here I want to give you some examples of where we might use it and some practical use cases. So first one is character and text recognition, right? We talked about this in class a little bit with the MNIST data set where we can draw um, a character, right? Or we can write a character and hopefully a machine learning model would be able to read that and automatically do it. So um, US Postal, Postal Service, right? You write down your address and you send the letter, right? Traditionally, you have a person that writes, types that address for you, right, before it goes in the system. But obviously, that's expensive. So we are going to train a model to do that, right? 
Uh, now it is scanned automatically, right? You put it onto the thing, it scans it automatically and it recognizes um, what letters that you put in, but it's kind of hard still, right? It's not as easy of a problem as just training a new network like that, right? Because people have different types of handwriting, right? I write in cursive, right? Other people might write in chicken scratch. So you need to be able to train a model that can really um, be able to handle all of these types of handwriting, all of these types of uh, ways that people write their characters. I mean, even just within um, a same type of handwriting, right? The character seven could be written in a number of ways, right? People can put a line through the middle, people can put a little hook at the top. So it could be curved, right? It could be curved or it could be straight. So your model has to be able to handle all of these. So your data has to uh, include all the things that you expect it to be able to perform on. Medical imaging. So here's a pretty cool application, right? So it's cancer detection, right? So if I take a picture, an uh, x-ray picture of somebody's lung or their brain, right? Can I use a machine learning algorithm to cluster, right? Tell me if this cluster of things are probably a tumor, right? Again, safety critical applications. So don't trust the model on this, on this just because it said that it might be cancer, right? So if the model says that it's cancer and you instantly perform surgery to remove it, what if it's benign, right? What if the model is wrong? What if it's just a healthy clump of cells? So definitely something that is useful, right? Imagine um, a rural town, right? Doesn't have a lot of staff, doesn't have a lot of expertise doctors, right? You can use something like this to tell, well, is it likely to be cancer, right? If it's cancer, maybe we can send the patient out to a more specialized um, uh, medical center to actually look at it uh, in more details. But again, with last lecture, I kind of talked about the fact that when a machine model is, machine learning model is right a lot of the times, it's very easy to start trusting it, right? It's right 99% of the time. Why would it be wrong the hundredth time, right? So definitely need to keep in mind that these are statistical, so at some point they are going to be wrong. Autonomous driving, right? We have our campus bus that uses neural networks as part of its decision making. Waymo, Cruise, Tesla, and so on. These definitely all use some kind of neural network to process their inputs. Um, here's an example of a Waymo data set. So uh, the Google Car Waymo actually releases their um, data set to uh, researchers so they can play with it. Here's a neural network that's trained on it. Right, and you can draw bounding boxes around the things that are interesting, like cars, right, pedestrians, uh, other obstacles, right. So this one is actually filtered out a little bit, but um, a full DNN that works on this can actually detect signs, right? It can detect like obstacles in the middle of the road, like fire hydrants and so on. Okay, so text and speech recognition again, like the and this data set, right? Your Siri, your Google, your Alexa, all that stuff definitely uses a lot of neural networks to power what it's able to do. Data prediction. So time series uh, forecasting. Uh, unfortunately, I can't really get too deep into details of time series forecasting, but uh, imagine you have a body of historic data, right? So we know what the, the weather is like last year. We know what the weather is like in the past 50 years, right? Can we use that information to figure out what our weather would look like this year? Predicting uh, financial information, right? Is the stock going to go up or down, right? Again, a lot of historic data based on you know previous performance in September, right? So stocks specifically, we know that in September it's going to drop, right? It's usually going to take a little bit of a 10% dip and then go back up past October. So can we use this information, right? And predict what it might look like this year, right? Maybe we know that it's going to be a little bit worse because we have other information about it, right? Maybe the stocks already are falling, so there's momentum. Uh, COVID data, right? This is pretty big. Machine learning model is actually pretty big into predicting the number of COVID cases in a specific community, right? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? When is it going to be at its peak. So yeah, uh, other applications, right, include AlphaGo, right? So this is one of the most um, talked about things at, when it was released, developed by uh, DeepMind, which is a Google team now. And uh, this AlphaGo al um, algorithm is basically able to play Go, which is a, kind of like a chess game, right? Checker or chess-ish game. And it's actually able to beat pros, right? It's surpassing human capabilities in terms of these games, right? And um, when they retired it, Google took it one step further and then trained it on to be able to play general games, right, uh, in chess. So it actually beat like quite a bit of the experts in chess in best of threes. Um, the way that this neural network worked is it actually trained on itself, right? So it played against itself many, many different times, and each time it got better at playing the game because you know you, you learn how to get better. So when we get to the end of it, um, AlphaGo actually was trained pretty well. But did you think of? random guessing of how to play chess to 
to be able to beat pros, right? Just by training by yourself, right? Just playing against yourself is very impressive of a feat. What about Dota 2? Does anyone here play games? Yeah, anyone know what Dota is? So it's an online multiplayer, right? It's five players play against five other players. And obviously, when you're controlling your character, there's a lot more input space, right? There's a lot of more things to do than just move a chess piece. So in chess or Go, your solution space is discrete, where you take a move, you're specifically moving a piece one square at a time, right? And what your opponent does also is the same thing, where it's one square at a time. Dota 2 is a continuous space, where you can control your character in different directions, right? And this is not like left, right, up, down, right? This is, you could control it to any degree, right? You can use a number of different abilities. So you have a much bigger space that you're, a, you're, you're requiring to do a network to learn from. But uh, OpenAI 5 is an LSTM-based model. So remember when we talked about this earlier, this type of model is able to remember context, right? About the things that happened before, about the input that you gave it before. So OpenAI trained this neural network that actually was able to beat professional teams at playing this game. So uh, any questions about applications and where we currently use AI models? Obviously, there's a lot more, right? There's a lot more where we use it. And these are just some of the examples that I've, I've given. OK, language models. This is kind of what everyone is about, right? Interested? All right, so natural language processing, uh, we talked about this before with the uh, RNNs and LSDMs, are generative AI. So we give it some prompts and we want it to generate something back to us. Uh, these models can remember previous contexts, again, the things that we we're talking about, uh, semantics, uh, and previous words, right? So um, I'll go into this attention thing a little bit more in details in the next couple of slides, but uh, we train this on a lot of data extracted directly from the internet, text data. Right, so we're actually training a model to imitate how humans behave. Right, we're, we're training chat to talk like a human. Right, we're teaching it how to respond like a human. So first thing is we need to first convert um, uh, words into tokens. Right. So what might that look like? Uh, let's see. Maybe I have a here. I'll, I'll give you an overview of how it works first. All right. So given a string, I want you to predict the next word. So this is actually how chat works. Okay. So. What is the highest probability to be the next word? Is essentially what chat is doing over and over again for each word, right? So you give it a prompt. For example, what is your name, right? And if I'm chat, right, I would say my name is Kira. But how do I get there, right? For human, we have I don't know. It's encoded into our brain, right? We kind of know how to converse. But for a machine learning algorithm such as chat, the way that it works is we look through this token repository. You can think of this as a dictionary or the words that we know, right? And we figure out, given your question, what is your name? What is the most likely character that should be coming, right? So if this is my word repository, obviously it's a lot bigger than this, right? My is probably the most likely thing that I should say in response to your question, right? So my and then, okay. So now that I have my as my first word, what should I say is my second word that makes the most amount of sense, right? So then we have name, right? Because the context that you ask to be is what is your name, right? So it's my name. And then you do this repeatedly over and over again, and you guess at which word has the most probability that the human is going to be satisfied with your response. So my name is Hira. And this is literally how chat works, right? It's literally a text predictor that takes in what you gave it as a context, as a prompt, and then it generates some text based on probability of it. So again, tying it back to this theme of statistical approach to do things. Now, now that we know how it kind of works, do you trust chat to do you know, important things, right? Probably not, right? Okay, tokenization. So this is essentially how we're mapping text into numbers, right? So uh, I know at the beginning of uh, last lecture, I talked about Polish words, right? Words are kind of arbitrary, so it's hard to get information encoded out of them. But it turns out when you have a lot of words, there are correlations between these words, right? So when I give you some terms, right? Like wife, husband, Right, and man and woman. There are some correlation between these things, right? Man is associated with husband, right? Associated with king and so on. So there are some relationship between these words that we can uh, encode into the space in order to learn from it. So let's see. Here I have actually another demo to show you what it might look like. All right, zoom. Did you go away? Okay. 
So here's an example of what uh, word vector projection might look like. Uh, obviously, we're showing this in a three-dimensional space, but in reality, this is many, many high dimensions that can't be shown. Um, and I'm going to do what I'm going to do here is so you can see here, right? All the things that are related to uh, girl, daughter, niece, right, are clustered into the clump because they're somewhat related to each other, right? So you can think of these as numbers, by the way. Uh, when we take a word and we map it to some kind of number, right? And now we find some relationship between these numbers, between these words, which, you know, all the um, female things are kind of clumped here, right? Computer, chair, right? These are kind of things that appear together in text usually quite a bit, appears in a clump, right? Um, man and king uh, kind of appears on a different axis than the rest of these. And let me see. Okay, so down here, I should be able to, yeah. All right, so I can put in some notation here and maybe this would be a nice visualization of what it is. So here's an example of um, what the relationship between a man and a king is to what a woman to some kind of thing is, right? So here, as English, we expect it to be a queen, right? Because if a man is a king, then a woman is a queen. So now this tool drew two arrows, two vectors in a space that tells us where the correlation is. But we can see here, these two arrows actually are very close to each other, right? Like they, they are in the same direction, vectors, right? Magnitude and uh, directions, right? So they're in the same direction, they're in the same magnitude to each other, except it's just spatially shifted, right? So obviously words have some kind of context with each other that we're able to draw some information, draw some patterns from. So that's word embedding. Uh, that's the first step of LLMs. And then the second step is something called a transformer. So this is a paper introduced by Google in 2017, and it's probably the most, it is, definitely the most famous paper in our field, right? Um, most of the researchers have definitely heard and or read this paper. Now, this paper is truthfully very, very complex. I spent a summer trying to read this and I still have no idea what is happening with the math, but I can tell you at a high level how it works. Um, these people are uh, from Google Research, by the way. None of them actually works for uh, DeepMind anymore. So this paper actually is also, uh, so Google used to publish a lot of their research um, you know, they're, they're, big, they're a big research body. But after this paper got released, um, according to my brother who works at Google right now, they no longer allow any kind of research publications without really, really high up approval. You have to go through like quite a bit of a complex stuff because uh, OpenAI obviously took their idea and really brought it to life, right? ChatGPT is something that, you know, Google will probably want their hands on first before anyone else. Okay, so the idea here is we can embed more than just individual uh, code for each um, work, right? Rather than just number map to it, and then we're going to pass it through a neural network, we're going to try to wrap some contextual meaning out of these words. So something called an attention head in these transformer is what we use to pass information between characters in a sentence, right? Normally, your neural network takes each character and it passes through the neural network by themselves. So that information between two words are not encoded, right? That information cannot be extracted from your text. But um, as we know, words have different meaning, right? So the word mole can mean a lot of things in different contexts, right? It can, it can mean like um, a creature, a thing of a mole, right? It could mean in a chemistry sense, a mole of something, right? It can mean mole as in like the moles on our uh, bodies. So how can chat or transformer models understand that, right? Because if you see the word mole, right? And you map this to a number, to you, it's just a number, but context matters, right? So the things that happen in a sentence matter to determine what it means for a word and where you should draw that space. So attention hat is a way that each character can essentially propagate their information to other characters in the same sentence, right? To be able to get some information out of this lane space. Okay, so challenges, right? LLMs will always give you an output. We shown with the crosser example, right? If it doesn't know, it will generate some text based on what it thinks is right. Now, this is obviously a very big challenge because one, it doesn't, under, it doesn't actually understand semantics, right? It's just a text predictor. So you give it some kind of concept, you give it some kind of prompt, and it does its best to answer you based on what it thinks you might like as an answer. But um, obviously it can be inappropriate, it can be incorrect, or it's not useful at all, right? Uh, an example I'd like to give here is uh, if you ask chat, right? I've got three wet 
shirt that I want to dry, and I uh, and I hang him on the line, right? How long does it take? Right, three minutes. I'm going to assume that it takes three minutes for three shirts to dry. All right. Now, what if I line nine shirts up in the same string? How long does it take to dry? It's still three minutes, right? Right. It only takes three minutes to dry each shirt. If you line them up, nine of them, then it you know it should still take three minutes. But what does chat say? Nine minutes, right? But that's wrong. Although I would say that it's actually interesting because it's not necessarily completely incorrect, right? There are some linear information in the first sentence that you said, right? Three shirt correlates to three minutes. The nine shirt kind of correlates to nine minutes, right? They're kind of, they're, there's some form of path where there could be a right answer, right? You could consider, oh, you know, it's not completely wrong. Uh, misinformation campaign, right? So if you trained your information on the internet, right, it will actually pick up a lot of things such as misinformation campaign. And if you ask chat about it, it might spit out those information, right? Same with the pizza example that I gave you before, right? Adding Elmer's glue. What about citations and copyrights? How do we deal with that? Okay, generative AI. Uh, any questions on chat? I know it's a very, very high level overview. Unfortunately, I you know, we can talk a whole semester about what chat actually is. Okay, Gen AI. Gen AI, um, very close to chat, right? Uh, rather than just generating text, we're actually inter interested in maybe images or audio and speech and so on. So the way that these works is, uh, there's a lot of ways to do it, right? But I'm going to talk about something called a GAN, a generative adversarial network, right? And uh, they're concerned, oh, sorry, uh, they're concerned with generating uh, data, right? So the way that the GANs work is very close to DNN, right? So the way that you train it is the GAN generates some kind of output. So this could be given a bunch of images, and I tell you to generate the images that are close to what my sample looks like, right? And then I'm going to have a, something called a discriminator. This could be another DNN, right? Or it could be a human. And this thing, this discriminator is going to say, I like that, or I don't like that, right? It's going to say, I think that looks like something that a human would have done. I think that that fits the criteria, right? And if that does a good job, then the model learns that that's a good thing. And if it generates some crap, right, and you discriminate, say, that's not realistic, right, then it's going to take that information and uh, update its model's weights. So really, the way that GANs work is through this iterative process of having the model generate a bunch of um, stuff that you want to generate, and then you have the discriminator tell it whether it's a good thing or not a good thing, and then you update the model in response. And uh, the final product that you get is actually something that can generate images that are pretty good for the most part, right? Does anyone use Gen AI to generate images, chats, image generator, and stuff? Yeah. Did you notice anything? Did it do a good job? Did you look? Did you look at it? No. No. Okay. So I have a friend. Uh, every Wednesday, we we do some dinners with a bunch of us, and we send out invites, right? And he uses chat to generate them. Um, for one of the images, it was a setting in fall, right? And we we're all outside eating kind of like a, um, you know, you think 1800, 1700 American, right? But there's a stove outside. And this stove outside, uh, this town has no electricity, by the way, right? It's just a poster. So the stove outside has a washing machine at the bottom of it. But if you just glance at the image, right, it looks right. So this is, again, another challenge is the discriminator might say that something looks like a human would accept it. But it doesn't, again, know that that's not realistic, right? Very close to what chat does, right? The things that you, you read something that chat says, it's like, oh, yeah, sure, whatever. But then you read it again, and you actually try to understand what chat is saying. Then you're like, wait, what? Right, same thing here. OK, um, next problem that I want to talk about. Uh, I know this is, this is quite a bit of a jump here. So this is something called matrix completion, um, away from um, LMs and other AI stuff. So this is, again, another really prominent problem that we are trying to solve in uh, practice. Probably not solvable. But let's say I give you a sparse matrix. right? So this matrix here is missing a bunch of numbers. That's what it means to be sparse. And I want you to fill in some numbers. right? Can you guess what are the numbers in these missing entries? Hard problem? A little hard, right? Not a lot of information. Well, I mean, I made this matrix so I can tell you what it is, right? So you have uh, the first 
character two comes from the uh, column, um, sorry, the, the row counts, and then the second one is the column, right? So two, three is second and third, right? So you're able to get that information somewhat, and here this would be four, four, right? So you're guessing what is missing in this matrix. Now, um, when I say sparse, I really do mean sparse, right? So imagine this, but I give you two numbers, right? And I make this a really, really big grid. Can you imagine where we might use this problem? Where might this problem come into handy? Come into handy. All right, let me give you a hint. Yeah. Sudoku. Uh, potentially. Yes, potentially. Okay. What about commercially? Let me give you Amazon. All right. Any guess? What about YouTube? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. So matrix completion is mostly concerned with recommenders. So this is again a very big prevalent problem right now because you know Amazon wants to sell you stuff, right? YouTube wants to recommend you videos that it thinks you'll watch. So um, matrix completion is an open-ended problem, which a lot of these companies are trying to gather a bunch of data, right? But data about you is sparse, right? It only knows certain things about you. So can we correctly guess at what's missing, right? Can we correctly guess at what you are interested in in order to be able to sell ads to you, right? In order to be able to, you know, suggest uh, some songs to you if you're listening on Spotify and you like, you know, a specific genre of music. So yeah, a uh, very hard problem currently still trying to be solved. I don't know if it's solvable, but uh, if you have an idea how to do this, you know, apply to Amazon, apply to Google, how are you gonna get in, All right? So any remarks, right? So we've talked about what DNNs are and how they work. We'll give you some examples of, you know, what some architecture might look like, some applications, and they're definitely very powerful. We can definitely apply them to many different types of applications that we uh, previously weren't able to solve before, right? And traditionally, um, software requires a lot of work, right? It's hard to be able to teach software how to identify between cat breeds and so on. But um, by being able to extract that information directly from a bunch of data, we kind of bypass the whole process, right? But again, they're not a silver bullet, right? I know um, it kind of is being sold as a silver bullet right now. Like the amount of times that you've passed by in so store and see powered by AI, right? Almost every single electronic device is powered by AI. Is it? Right. Um, so uh, I said this before, right? When you have a hammer, everything kind of looks like a nail to you, right? But really got to ask yourself, is this the right applications of DNNs or machine learning first? Um, here's an example that I like to give is uh, one of the meeting rooms that we have, right? Bought this um, device. So it's a Zoom device that sits in the middle of the room, right on the table. And it has mics on each side and has a camera on top. And there was a big advertisement on the box that says powered by AI to be able to detect who is speaking, right? And hand the camera to them. That's kind of overkill, right? Do we need AI for that? You have mics surrounding the entire thing, right? So wherever you pick up sound, just turn the camera to it. You don't need AI for problems like this, right? So again, when someone sells you, if a company tells you, you know, can we use AI to do this? It's really a buzzword, right? Um, I have a friend that works in Boston uh, for an internship this summer, and uh, she's doing some kind of medical internship. And the thing that they asked her was, can you make us a ChatGPT language model? Right? What? Do you know how much computational power it takes, how much training data it takes to train chat? Right? It, it's, it's not doable, especially not for an internship, right? So, but again, these companies have an idea of what AI is, right? It's the new term, it's the new shiny thing. So they're going to, think that you know they need to hop onto the train. So really, I think whenever you see AI being mentioned, definitely think, well, do we need it here, right? Is it useful here? So um, another comparison that I like to do is with Stack Overflow. Right? Stack Overflow has been around forever. I mean, I'm a boomer, right? I, I took undergrad here and I started in 2015 and we had Stack Overflow. So to me, ChatGPT is very close to Stack Overflow, right? If you know what you're doing, then Stack Overflow is a great tool, right? You know what you're doing, you know what you need, so then you go on Stack Overflow and you find a snippet of code that you need, right? Same thing with AI, right? If you know what you need, right, and you know specifically what you want to ask the prompts for, and you know how to check if it's correct or not, 
it's probably a great tool, right? Definitely, you know, make sure you do your testing with it. But if you don't know what you're doing and you're just relying on chat to do all your coding for you, then is there any reason why, you know, we'll hire you over just using chat? And this is a final XKCD that I like to end with. Um, this is about automation, but it really can be applied to machine learning, right? And it goes to show here that, like, in theory, you're going to spend a lot of time writing code and then, um, right? Uh, but what if we just write a bunch of code, right, to automate this process, right? What if we just train the DNA model to do whatever we can for us, right? And the idea is, once we're done with this model, our workload just disappears, right? If you automate some kind of script to do your job, then hopefully you don't have to do your job anymore. You just run the script. But in, re in practice, right, what you end up doing is you're training this model, you're writing all this code, you're doing all this debugging, and then it fails, and you have to retrain. Now it turns out you're actually spending more time, right, trying to train this model. But in practice, right, all, all the work that you're doing is still blowing up, right? You still have to do the work in the meantime. So um, this example of automation, I, I love this, right? And it really generalizes, ah, generalizes, generalizes well into machine learning, right?